I didn't have the best relationship with my uncle. It hadn't always been like this, though. I remember my childhood and how we'd spend a lot of time together. Some time after I turned six, though, he suddenly went dark and his visits nearly ended completely. He used to come around once every two months, and then, out of the blue, I was lucky to see him once every ten years. He'd nearly become a distant memory when I received a phone call from him asking for me to visit him. I was going to say no, but then he dropped the bombshell that he was dying. Years of smoking had caught up to him, and he didn't have much time left. He even offered to pay for my flight. My uncle lived on a ranch far removed from other people. I think his closest neighbors lived about 20 miles away from his patch of land. He seemed to enjoy it this way, and I'd wondered about it before. I soon found out why. I knocked on the door, and it opened to reveal the smiling face of my uncle. He was far removed from the memories I had of him, just... Barely recognizable, but that's what ten years and cancer can do to a person, I suppose. He invited me to sit down, and we exchanged a few pleasantries and general chit-chat. My uncle had brought out some snacks, which I had enjoyed as a child. Honestly, I didn't like them as much now that I was older, but I didn't want to say that and just thanked him instead. It was after an hour that he got to the meat of the matter. Now, nephew, he said. He actually used my name while talking, but I don't want to reveal it, so I'll just replace it with nephew for the sake of this, and I'll address him simply as uncle. Are you big on the whole saving the rainforest thing? Oh, right. Uh, yeah, I still want to help protect the environment. I've started a project to help save a type of frog within South America, and there's this big... My uncle raised up a hand. Sorry. I would love to hear about it. I did love all your stories when you were little. You had such a vivid imagination. Honestly, though, I thought you'd never actually embark on a journey to become a real environmentalist, but I'm glad you did. Nephew, I don't have a lot of time left, and so I want to get straight to the point. He took a deep breath. Do you... Believe in monsters. Monsters? I asked, confused. Yes, my uncle said. Monsters. They exist. You might not believe in them now, but you will once this is over. I don't understand. Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that every species on Earth has a right to be protected? He asked. Well, yeah. I said. And if you had the power to save one of them, would you? I, yeah, yeah, I would. My uncle relaxed a little. He then got up to get his rifle. Do you know how to use one of these? Yeah. Uh, my dad taught me, but I never actually used one in a dangerous situation before, I professed. You probably won't need it, but take it anyway, he said. I'll explain what this is about, but I need you to come with me somewhere. We then spent 15 minutes hauling supplies to the back of his truck. All in all, it was probably enough to last some several months, and I was honestly confused as to why my uncle would need that much. While he drove me out to our destination, he started talking again. Do you believe in Bigfoot? Sasquatches, he said. Bigfoot? I said and laughed. The town where I grew up had a Bigfoot sighting ten years ago. It wasn't all too famous outside of it, though, and I doubt anyone outside of our town has ever heard of it. Well, you see, when you think of stories like ape men or the like, my uncle continued you'll know that the indigenous people also had similar stories of seeing such creatures. That seems to tell me that they probably are real, but that leads to another question, of course. Why haven't we ever found one? It's said that at one point, the population of humans on Earth was only 10,000, but we bounced back from that. 
we assume that there are even one-tenth that amount of them around, only a thousand, we should still have found traces of them, dead bodies. There should be videos of them migrating for food, but there aren't any, and all you ever can find is very bad grainy footage occasionally. <laughs> so, they're not real then, I said with a shrug. My uncle shook his head. There's an easy answer to that paradox. The reason we haven't found them was that they were hunted to near extinction by people like me. I was waiting for the laugh, indicating that this was a joke, but it never came. It was after my stint in the army. I was looking for work and I was an experienced hunter to boot and some suits from the feds round to try and recruit me. They said I had to hunt a kind of ape and I needed the cash at the time, so I agreed. Never really found out why it was the government that wanted them gone. Some of them, other hunters had theories. Some said we were harvesting their organs. Others said that we were going to clone them, make super soldiers. Some people thought that the Bigfoot was actually more advanced than us and would threaten our position as the dominant species on this earth. I have a much simpler theory. We hunted them because we wanted their land. Bigfoot tends to be rather docile most of the time, but they are also very territorial. Some people must have died at one point because of them while encroaching on their land and the government realized that we had to wipe them all out. Of course, this is in the 1800s, and if the public got wind of it, well, it would be bad, so the project was kept hidden. I was pretty good at it. Had a total of 339 confirmed kills. Never thought anything about it at first. I just thought I was hunting any other kind of animal until one day. I was all alone tracking two of these creatures when one of them almost got the jump on me. I managed to kill it with a lucky shot and thank the gods, or else I wouldn't be here today. The other one ran away and I went after it. I was able to finish it off twenty minutes later and I followed some of its older tracks to a small enclave in the woods. Sands began to shake a little and I offered to drive. No, it's fine. I had never seen a child before then. A child Bigfoot, that is to see. Well, a baby animal was still an animal after all, so I raised my gun when it did something none of them had done before. It spoke. I'd heard roars and growls before, but never actual words. Two syllables. Mama. It said them again, and something else began wailing. The way it said that, it kind of reminded me of you, nephew. He smiled fondly. I know you can't remember, but I remember holding you in my arms while you spoke your first words. <laughs> you were so adorable back then. His smile vanished. It was then what I was doing hit me. I wasn't saving humanity from some rabid animals. I was wiping out another species, which may be as smart, maybe even smarter than us, my uncle said. I never mentioned what happened to anyone else, but I quit some time later. I'm sorry. I wasn't around more while you were growing up. I secluded myself here. I, I had to. He stopped. We had arrived at a small clearing. He handed me the rifle, got off the truck. There's something I haven't told you. There was a reason some of us thought that the Bigfoot was superior to us. They have a special skill, so to speak. At first we thought they had some kind of telepathy, but no. They were able to communicate with a special type of sound wave that travels for hundreds of miles. It's a frequency humans can't hear, but once we use special equipment and we're able to detect it. That's why it's so hard to find them once you encounter them. 
that one will contact every single other one in a hundred mile radius and tell them to run. My uncle pulled out a strange flute. You know what a dog whistle is, right? This is kind of the same thing. Until then, it had occurred to me that this might have been some sort of elaborate joke. My uncle wasn't really a prankster, but maybe he'd wanted to make me laugh one last time or something. That, or maybe the medications were interfering with his reasoning ability. He played something on the flute, and nothing happened for ten minutes. Even though my neck kept turning at the slightest sound made in the forest, every twig snapping or bird chirping nearly made me jump as the suspense dialed up to a crescendo when I finally told myself to relax and take a deep breath. And then, I knew that my uncle was perfectly sane and hadn't been telling me some weird story. Out of the corner of my eyes, I saw a dark figure emerge. Now, you've probably seen some footage or drawings of Bigfoot. I'll say that many of them are reasonably accurate. You're looking at something about eight feet tall, which is very ape-like. That is to say, except for the face. The face is surprisingly human, and it made me wonder how it was that my uncle kept killing them without a bit of remorse for so many years. It had a strange way of walking and paused after taking two steps. It pointed a finger at me. Who is... He. The words were deeper than any other voice I'd heard and a little garbled, but the meaning was clear enough. He's my nephew, my uncle said. He then pointed to his truck. I got you all you need, but I'm dying. I won't be around for long. He turned to me. I, I hope he'll keep taking care of you, but my time here is up began to cry, something I'd never thought he'd do. If you want to kill me, you can do it now. A chill went down my spine. I was the one who killed your parents. I think you know that. May as well take me out of my misery now. The thing raised a hairy fist and I raised the rifle reflexively, but my uncle put a hand up to stop me. This is what I want. I hesitated, and that was a fatal mistake. Even if I'd wanted to, there was no way I would have reacted in time to save my uncle. But no killing blow came. Instead, the thing pointed a finger at my uncle and said... Mama? Tears flowed down my uncle's face like a faucet. <laughs> After all this time. I helped my uncle, who was sobbing, so it was really me doing all the work, unload the supplies, and we drove off. What was that about? I asked him angrily. Were you really going to let it kill you? It's a he my uncle corrected. And I've done so much wrong, nephew, throughout my life. Raising him was just a partial atonement for my sins. I know it isn't enough. I can't even walk to church and confess my sins to anyone. He then paused. I'm sorry, though. I didn't want to drag you into this, but someone needs to keep supplying him with food. I keep him hidden, but if he goes out to forage for food, he'll be found some day, and this place isn't big enough for him to live off the land. Why this rifle, then? Because, my uncle said, I was worried that he might try to kill you as revenge instead of me. After all, I killed some of his family. He might have considered that to be fair. But I wouldn't let him hurt you. Of course, I was completely wrong was thinking about what I would have done. But he isn't like me. He's much better and bigger of a person than I am. 
It was then I realized what my uncle had been talking about earlier. The monsters he spoke of. He wasn't talking about the Bigfoot I'd just seen. He was talking about humans. Part of it must have been about himself. Most of it must have been about the other people who had organized the hunt for these creatures, who still walked the earth freely with no guilt in their souls. So what do I have to do? I asked. My uncle's eyes lit up a bit. Will you do it? Will you take care of him for me? Michael said that he would leave his investments, totaling $12 million, as well as the ranch. It would be more than enough for me to keep the place running. I could even hire some helpers to work the ranch, though he advised against it as some of them might talk. My uncle died three months later. I was with him when he passed away. As he couldn't confess his darkest sin to the pastor, he confessed it to me instead. For the last four years, I've been running this place mostly smoothly. Something strange did happen last time I went to supply him. Behind him, I saw two shadows. One was a bit shorter than him, and one was even shorter than me. It appeared that he'd found himself a partner, and even a child. Where'd they come from? Most likely he had signaled to her using their special call that he had. Two of us didn't talk too much, but I did tell him I was happy for him. He smiled back and said, Thank you, brother. For many of you who enjoy hunting for Bigfoots, not in the sense that my uncle did, of course, I just mean people who like searching for the signs of Bigfoot. I have a message to pass on to you all. Don't bother. You'll never find them. They know how to hide from humans. Many, if not all, the sightings you hear about are just hoaxes. I even had the suspicion that many of the hoaxes are done by the government to discredit true sightings. But I know that I can't solve this problem alone. If people don't know what's happening, the few remaining ones will be killed, and I can't save a species like that. I need to get the word out to let the public know what the government's been doing behind your back, and we can't let them continue. I've devoted lots of time to saving these creatures, but I can't do it myself. Already, I know many of you will dismiss this as a tall tale, but for those of you who do believe, remember the best thing you can do for these creatures is simple. Leave them alone. In case you do find one, or think you saw one in the area, maybe you could leave something to eat for them. But it's doubtful they'll come back to that area. After all, I wouldn't trust humans after what they've gone through. I have a mundane life. I worked the same insurance company for five years. I don't see any reason to change jobs anytime soon. Dated the same girl for the past four months. So far, it's been going well. There are no big surprises or peaks of excitement in my day-to-day, but there are no real valleys or dangers either. Overall, I'm pretty happy with that. My best friend Will has always been quite the opposite. In high school, he was the one that pressured me into cutting class. In college, our couple of -of spur-of-the-moment trips to Atlantic City and Mexico were his idea, not mine. I'd always followed his lead, at least after some harassment and nudging, and I guess he thought I always would. When we graduated, though, I was ready to put down roots in the real world. Get a job, get a life, that kind of thing. Well... He wanted to go travel Europe and Asia for a couple of years with very little planning and less money. I know he thought he could convince me to go with him, and I think when I stood firm and told him no, he almost saw it as a betrayal. Never said that, of course, but I could see the hurt in his eyes when I shut him down, and in the five years since he left, I've only heard from him a handful of times. Maybe... 
maybe that makes him sound like an asshole. And I don't know that I disagree, but I also didn't change the fact that he's been my best friend for most of my life. When he suddenly showed up at my door one Saturday afternoon, I was excited and happy more than anything else. It wasn't until we were past the initial greetings and sitting in my living room that I started to realize that something was wrong. The way Will's voice sounded, sharp and brittle in a way I didn't like. The look in his eyes, harder and more wary than I remembered from just ten months ago when I'd seen him last. When I asked him what he was doing, he'd laughed and tell me that he was doing great before launching into some news story about the two months he spent in Morocco, or how he got held by airport security in Kuala Lumpur for 12 hours because he accidentally said the word bomb in Bahasa, Malaysian. On the surface, he was the same Will, full of life, stories, more than a little shit, but overall a good guy that was fun to be around. Except now... It was just the surface. It was almost as though he was playing the character of Will, the version of himself that he knew I was used to and expected. And beneath that thin shell, well, I didn't know, but it worried me. Still, when he fended off my attempts to see what was going on with him, I decided my best option was to just let it go for now. Either it was my imagination, or he'd loosen up after we hung out a while and tell me what was really going on. That's why when he suggested we head into the city, I didn't try to dissuade him. I wasn't sure how long he would be around this time, but at least for the weekend, I was going to try and keep him happy while I figured out how worried I needed to be. I thought at first he was going to take us on a club or a pub crawl, but no said he had something special to show me. A surprise. Forcing a smile, I told him I was in. We drove for two hours, past the heart of the city, to the northern outskirts that were largely warehouses and industrial plants. I asked him where he was going a couple of times, but he'd just laugh and say that I'd see when we got there. When we finally pulled up to a chain link gate and gave our names to a huge slab of guard wearing an ill-fitting sport coat and earpiece, it took everything I had to wait until we were inside the parking lot to ask again what this was. Was it something illegal? Will snickered at me. (laughs) What, do you think I brought you to a cockfight or something? I shrugged, my face growing hot. I I don't know. Who knows with you, man? But it doesn't look like a normal kind of party either. His smile faded a little as he parked next to the massive warehouse in the middle of the lot. No, it's not. It's pretty weird. Exclusive kind of deal. I had to pay five large each of us to have a slot tonight, and I booked it two months ago. It fills up fast. I frowned at him. What fills up fast? Enough with the mystery, man. Shaking his head, he turned off the rental car and opened his door. Not yet. You'll see inside. Come on. I let out a sigh and got out of the car. Will wasn't looking at me, but at the ten or so other cars parked around the edge of the building. This is honestly more people than I'm used to seeing, but it's the first time I've been to this one, or one in America at all. He shrugged and pointed at a nearby door with another thick-necked guard standing next to it. This way, I guess. He again gave our names, which must have already been relayed by the first guard to the guy at the door, because he immediately turned, telling us the rules. No drinking, no drugs, and no electronics were allowed inside. Will winced and apologized, tossing me the keys to the car and gesturing for me to go stick my phone back inside. I was leery about going into this weird place without any way of calling, but... Well, for all his recklessness and recent weirdness, I still trusted Will. And whatever wild orgy or bizarre show was behind that door, I didn't think he'd ever put me in any real danger. Once my phone was stowed back in the car, the guard opened the way inside the building and stepped aside. We went down a short, dark hallway that 
dog-legged twice before opening up into a huge area. Looks as though most of the interior space of the warehouse had been walled off into one or more massive rooms, with the edges of the rooms being largely empty aside from a few chairs, mattresses, and pillows. I felt a nervous twinge in my chest. What was this? Some kind of modern opium den? I didn't see any drugs, or many people for that matter. There were a couple more guards standing in opposite corners, and a group of three well-dressed women taking to one side of the large platform in the middle of the room. The platform itself looked to be made of white stone rising three or four feet off the concrete floor of the warehouse, with steps going up to a flat U-shaped top that was open at the bottom. At the top, with her head resting against the edge of the center void of the U, was a middle-aged woman lying on her back. In the center void itself was a man in a hospital bed. His body slid up enough and positioned just right so that the crown of his bald scalp touched the top of the woman's head as they both lay motionless. What the fuck is this? I breathed the question like a whisper, but it still felt obscenely loud in the relative stillness of that place. Other than the low murmurings of the women speaking together and the periodic hisses and beeps of the equipment hooked to the man in the hospital bed, there were no other sounds. And I felt a thrill of fear that breaking that silence would make everyone turn toward me, turn on me. Instead, Will just put his hand on my shoulder and steered me to the other end of the room further away from the guards and women. If any of them even noticed us at all, they gave no sign, but he still kept his voice low when he responded. I'll explain. Just stay chill and listen, okay? I nodded and he began. This place. There are places like it all over the world. They're all very secretive and they go by different names. The most common ones I've heard is the sleeping man, though it doesn't have to be a man. I've been to three before this one, and then one in Veru had a little girl. I leaned in a little closer as I tried to speak softly. But what is this place? What are these people doing? He nodded. It's all based on something called the Kaminsky Effect. It's named after the scientist that was a part of experiments on different kinds of consciousness that Russia was doing in the 50s. He found out that some people, particularly those in a long-term catonic state, believed the ability to share information with other people, both other people like them and people that were awake but relaxed and touching them for a while. Raising an eyebrow, I glanced toward the hospital bed. Like telepathy or something? Kinda, yeah. Look, I don't know all the details of how it's supposed to work, and I didn't know that anyone really understands it, but over time, people have figured out how to replicate it and get it to work. He gestured toward the platform. They sell 30-minute sessions where you lay with your head next to theirs, and most of the time, well, I know from experience, it works. He shook his head. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. I frowned at him. What do you see? How are they thinking anything if they're vegetables? His eyes widened slightly. No, man. They still think and dream. And being near one is like being connected to a network. You aren't just going into their dreams. You're going into something a lot bigger that is connected to the people like this around the world. It it changes everything. I saw a shimmer in his eyes before he looked away. That's why I wanted it for you, too. It means that much to me. I was torn between being touched and being horrified. Well, isn't this like human trafficking or or prostitution or something? Isn't it illegal? He shrugged. Not really. These people, they aren't coming back to, they aren't ever going to be the same again, okay? 
and they aren't stealing people away. My understanding is that everyone has been released by loved ones or local governments to be used for study, usually for a big chunk of change. Now, maybe someone might object if they knew how they were being used, but honestly, I I don't think it's that big of a deal. They aren't mistreated. Hell, they probably get better care here than most hospitals. They're cash cows, right? I shook my head slightly. I guess. But if it's all legit, why all the security and secrecy? Will grimaced slightly. <sighs> Shit, Sam. Legal or not, it looks pretty sketch, doesn't it? And they're trying to keep it all on the down low anyway. Weird thrills for the rich and exotic thrill seekers, yeah? He smiled. And occasionally, they're stick-in-the-mud best friends. He put his arm around my shoulder and steered me toward the edge of a room where there was another door. Past that, there was another room identical to the first in most particulars, except there was only one guard, with the only other people in the room being an old man smiling in our direction and the unmoving woman laying on the hospital bed at the center. Pushing me forward, he pointed me out to the old man. This is Sam. He's going first tonight. Are you comfortable, sir? The old man was wearing a white coat that reminded me of a dentist I used to see as a kid. Leaning over me, I could see my own anxious face reflected in his glasses, as well as the edge of red curly hair from the woman my head was resting against. I... I don't know. Are you sure it doesn't hurt her? I turned my head to look back at her, and I could see the low and steady blip of her heart rate on the equipment next to the bed. I looked back up at the old man and then looked over at Will. I mean, this isn't going to bother her or keep her from getting better, is it? The old man's fingers were cool and firm as he turned my face toward him in the ceiling. No need to worry, sir. She is well past any help or pain. The experiences she can still provide, however, they're a gift to us and give her a new renewed purpose. He offered a thin yellow smile. Now just close your eyes and relax. I tried to shut my eyes, but it was all too strange. I could feel... This poor woman's head against mine, and I didn't know what any of this was, but it felt wrong, and I started to sit up. Well, I I don't think I can... Will's expression was hard. Don't wimp out on me, Sam. I've been setting this up for months, all for you. You're the only one I trust to share with. Staring at him a moment, I swallowed and nodded. Okay. I laid back down, suppressing a shiver as my head rested against the woman's again. Closing my eyes, I felt suffocated by the black. This was all nonsense. It had to be, but I could just lay there for a few minutes, wait it out, and then maybe Will would at least feel like I tried to experience. Whatever this was supposed to be. Except the darkness was going away now. At first I thought it was just the ghost shapes you sometimes see behind closed eyes, but no, it was more than that. It was... I could see things. I was in a room, a giant room, but not like the warehouse. The floor was made of hard gray rock rippling like the tides of a river as it flowed to walls of polished ivory shot with thick red vines. Crimson lashes and bloody frothing leaves spread up to a ceiling taller than the highest cathedral and at its peak it opened up into a green night sky lit by a sickle of a yellow moon. The sickly light of that moon seemed to shift as I watched, pulling around the far end of the chamber, highlighting the nest of thorny rock that pushed up there like an errant stony wave. But it wasn't a wave. It was a chair. A throne. And while it looked 
empty. I could still sense a presence there, a terrible pressure like a coming storm, reaching out from the shadows around the dully glittered dais. As I felt hand grip my shoulder as a soft feminine voice whispered in my ear. We see you. We know you. I jerked back, turning to find myself looking into the pale blue eyes of a woman, a woman that I knew from another place, another world, another... It was her. I was asleep in the real world, and this was all a dream, wasn't it? And this woman, she was the woman giving me this cold and terrible place, and I could feel something coming up behind me, and I needed to wake up before I... I sat up and rolled away from the woman, gasping like a fish out of water as I crawled down the steps and onto the concrete floor of the warehouse. Will was beside me now, patting my back and telling me that I would be okay. After a minute or two, I gathered myself enough to crawl a few more feet away and sit up. Will came with me, waiting until I looked at him to speak. I guess you saw. Or... Well, what did you see? His face was tight and anxious, and any pretense of fun or frivolity was now gone. Tell me what you saw. I shuddered as I looked at him. It... It sent me to some place. Some kind of throne room, maybe? It felt like I was in some kind of horror movie or a nightmare, but it also felt real. I let out a shaky breath. Too fucking real. And did you see anyone? Did anyone talk to you? Staring at him, I nodded. Yeah. I saw her. The woman was in my dream. She talked to me. His eyes widened slightly. What did she say? Exactly. I frowned. Look, what the fuck is this? Did you know this was going to... Will leaned forward and gripped my arm tightly. Just tell me what she said, okay? Pulling away, I glared at him. Fuck, okay. She said something like, I see and know you. We see you, we know you. I nodded. Yeah, that. Looking toward the platform, I could just barely see the edge of her hair from where we'd sat. I turned back to him. How do you know that? Because I heard that once, too. Seeing motion out the corner of my eye, I turned to see the guard of an old man wheeling away all the monitors, the respirator even. What are they doing? Doesn't she need that stuff? I started to get up, but Will pulled me back down. No, she doesn't. It's just window dressing. You can pay a little extra for the pretense if you're bringing someone that might be squeamish. What do you mean? He met my gaze with a strange mixture of sadness and anger. I mean, she's dead, Sam. They always are. Sucking in a breath, I started shaking my head. That's... that's impossible. I I saw her in my dream, in her dream. How would she do that if she was dead? Will rubbed his eyes tiredly as he put his head down. (sighs) Because, Sam, death isn't the end of everything. It's just a door, and with some people, if their bodies aren't treated in a certain fashion, dying gives the body over. I was trembling now. I wanted to scream at him for tricking me, for being crazy, for lying, but that was all just self-deception, was it? What I really wanted to know was where I had been. What I'd seen. What had I been touched by? Dying gives the body over. To what? His smile was joyless when he looked back up at me again. 
You'll see. Just like I have. Now that they know you, they'll put you back more and more. I stood up, my fist clenched as I stalked over to the open end of the platform. This is all bullshit. It was a hallucination, or maybe it was a shared dream, but she sure as fuck isn't dead. I reached out to touch her bare foot. What is this, some kind of joke or a con? Because you're... She was cold as ice. Will looked miserable as he got up and walked closer. The dead still dream. They just dream of different things, dark and terrible places and things that, well, can see us and can know us. I realized I was still touching her foot and yanked my hand away in revulsion. Why? Why would you do this to me? When he looked at me now, his face was as cold as she had been. At first it was to get out of the trap, yeah? I felt guilty, but the scareder I got, the more I wondered if I could make a deal with them, get you to take my place before they pulled me down for good. Will shook his head. But they got me anyway. Four months ago. Maybe if I hadn't let my stupid fucking conscience get in the way, I would have shown you to them in time to save myself, but... If it even can work that way. Hell, even now I don't know for sure. I stared at him, tongue thick in my mouth. What do you mean they got you? He gave me a rictus smile as he laughed. Sam, the girl's not the only one that's dead. And I have things crawling in me now that... Well, you still have a lot more to see. When he took another step toward me, I ran. I made it through the door and into the other room where another of the chatting women was now lying on the platform, thrashing about as though the dead man's head was being pressed against her was an electrode. Gagging, I headed for the hallway in the exterior door, expecting to be stopped at every turn, but I never was. When I reached the parking lot, I had a moment of fresh panic until I realized that I still had keys from when I put my phone back in Will's rental car. I was backing out of the space when Will came walking out, waving to me. Good to see you again, Sam. And don't worry. I threw the car to drive and sped toward the gate, but not fast enough to escape his last words. We see you now. We know you. When I was 10 years old, I heard a man die and did nothing to help. It's not something I'm proud of, but I was just a scared kid at the time. I was often left home alone when I was a child. I won't say my parents didn't love me or anything so dramatic, but they had priorities. Oftentimes, I was not on that list. Still, I enjoyed the solitude. I had to run to the house and could pretty much get away with whatever I wanted while they were gone. As long as I made sure to clean up after myself. It was early February when it happened, while my folks were out on a part Valentine's part anniversary date. They'd married at this time of year around 15 years ago, so they'd make a big deal about it annually. It was snowy outside, and I wanted to go play in it while they were gone, but I had the biggest fear about inadvertently getting myself locked out of the house and freezing to death before anyone arrived to save me. It was close to 10 o'clock when my mom called and told me that they would not be home until morning. This would be neither my first nor last night alone in the house, so I assured her I'd keep the doors locked and go to bed at a reasonable hour. Surely what I considered reasonable and what she did were far different times. Were I being responsible, I would likely already be in bed, but I was happily in the middle of binging horror movies when she called. 
I won't say they never gave me nightmares, as my mother warned, but I still loved them. We had a great assortment of channels on our unlocked cable box, so it wasn't hard to track down movies to suit my late night taste. It was growing closer to midnight, and I felt my body begin to crave my bed when the commotion began outside. I peeked through the living room window to see a man, screaming and running across the street. He was yelling out for anyone to help him. He even ran to some of the neighboring houses and pounded on their doors. Help! For God's sake, somebody help me! He cried out in the night while he slammed his fists against the doors. Most houses just turned off their lights when all this began, but I couldn't look away. What could have gotten this guy so worked up? It was a typical suburban street that I lived in as a kid, like... Little to nothing ever happened, aside from the occasional car pulled over for one reason or another. Finally, the man arrived at my door. He beat his hands against the wood and shouted out, begging me to help. I was a kid. What the hell was I supposed to do? Please help me. They're coming. He yelled out from the other side of the door. I pulled a chair up to the door and I stood on it to look out at the peephole. The man looked young, maybe early 20s, though. To my perception at the time, he may as well have been in his 60s. He had dark beard stubble and wore a thick blue hoodie and knit cap and gloves. It was really cold outside, so I knew he had to be freezing. Please, just let me in, he whimpered softly. Just help me. I'm begging you. I felt bad for the guy, but I couldn't invite a stranger into the house, even if I believed he was truly scared. I can't help you, mister, I called out to him. I hoped he would just move on to the next house after he heard that I was just a child, but it just made him beg harder. Please, kid. I won't hurt you. I I just need to get off the street. He whined. My dad says I can't have people over, I said, hoping to rationalize with the man. Just... Just let me in. Please. He asked softly. I'm sorry, mister. I just can't. My dad would kill me. Suddenly, the man turned around and I felt him push his back to the door. His head was right in front of the peephole now and I couldn't see what was happening. Oh God, he said. I jumped down from the chair and ran to the living room window again. By the time I made it to the glass, he started screaming out and pounding on the door again. I heard the doorknob jiggle as he attempted to force his way in, but I'd locked it and deadbolted it. Jesus Christ, just let me in for God's sake, please! He was wailing, and his voice had given way to high-pitched shrieks. As I glared out the window, I saw three dark shapes speeding across the road in front of my eyes. They were almost blurry, as if I looked through an unfocused camera lens. I couldn't even make out what they were, but they darted off the road and toward my house. I whipped the curtains closed and sat down on the floor under the window. Suddenly the man's yells turned to blood-curdling squeals. I heard more pounding against the door as well as the walls of the house, along with a sound that reminded me of when my dad cut the turkey at Thanksgiving. The yells turned into gargles, and I heard something wet spray into the ground. In the siding of my home. I heard snapping and crunching sounds along with something like fabric being torn. After the man's gargling screams stopped, there was a chorus of shrill squeals that didn't resemble anything I'd ever heard before. It reminded me of when I would pinch the mouth of a balloon while letting the air out only much louder and more guttural. After a moment, everything fell silent again, but 
I would not get off the floor until some time later. When I finally did emerge from my safe spot under the window, I ran up to the stairs to my bedroom, locked the door, and hid under my blanket until I fell asleep. I was awakened the next morning by the sound of police sirens out front, accompanied by a loud knock on the front door. I peeked out of my bedroom window to see several police cars and a black SUV parked on the road in front of the house. I was too scared to answer the door since my folks had not arrived back home yet. I just stayed up in my room and ignored the hammering on the front door. After a while, the knocking stopped, but the police stayed out there until my parents drove up an hour or so later. My mom came flying through the door and up the stairs. She tried to get in, but my door was still locked. She just pounded and shouted for me to let her in. Her words, along with the knocking, sent a shiver up my spine after the previous night's events. I swung the door open and she pulled me into a hug. After a few minutes of holding me in place, she started grabbing at my arms, checking for injuries. When she was certain I was okay, she asked me if I'd heard anything last night. I'm not entirely sure why I lied to her and told her I didn't hear anything. Maybe I felt guilty about what I assumed had happened to the yelling stranger. It could have been as simple as I didn't want my folks to know I stayed up so late. Sometime later, my father came inside after the swarm of vehicles in our street thinned out. One of the cop cars and the black SUV stayed out in front for a while, and two officers went to each house in the neighborhood. It had been a bizarre series of events, but I paid it no mind after a couple of weeks passed. Sure, kids at school spun many a rumor that the murder had seemingly occurred on my street, though a body was never found. There was a great deal of blood that spread across the front of my parents' house and on the driveway. Some would theorize it was way more than the human body was capable of holding, but there had been a lot of exaggerated stories over that first week. For several months after the man begged to be allowed in my home, my parents refused to let me leave the house on my own. It was actually quite nice. Though I missed having the run of the place a bit, my folks were more attentive than they'd ever been. Again, I would never accuse them of being overly neglectful. They just never saw the danger in leaving the house with me as its only occupant until then. But of course, their new outlook didn't last for long. It was mid-December before I was left alone again. My parents had a Christmas party to attend with some friends, so they asked if I would be okay on my own. Given the fact that I had no desire to be left with some babysitter who was only a few years older than me, I said I would be fine. Truthfully, though, I enjoyed them being more attentive these days. I did miss my solitude. As was usually the case, my mom checked in around 10-ish, to which I informed her all was well. She told me they'd likely be home around 1 and recommended that I try to get to bed soon. Of course... I didn't plan on hitting the sack until I saw the lights of my parents' Honda rolling into the driveway, but she didn't need to know that. After successfully riding my makeshift Captain America shield down the stairs several times in a row, I decided to just hunt for a good R-rated movie to bide my time until I had to head up to my bedroom. It was right around midnight when the knocking on the front door pulled my attention away from Jason, steadily strolling after a fleeing, topless girl. Let me in, the voice called from outside. I instantly tensed up as my mind revisited the stranger who had left nothing more than a bloody pool across the front yard. My dad ended up having to repaint the house as the stains would not wash off. Even the concrete driveway still wore a few marks that would not clean up. Come on, kid. Let me in. I turned the volume up on the movie to an attempt to block out the sounds. 
Help me. Save me. Let me in. The voice called out, growing louder with every word. It wasn't like he was shouting. It was more like his vocal tones elevated in the same way I turned up the sound on the TV. Hesitant, I crept over to the window to peer outside. I saw no evidence of anyone or anything. The whole neighborhood appeared to be at rest, but I still heard the man behind the door. Just let me in. I I won't hurt you. I promise. He called out again. I quietly carried the same chair over to gaze through the peephole. I froze in place after I accidentally bumped wood to wood while attempting to position my prop. I know you're in there, kid. Just let me in, please. I climbed up to glance through the small, circular hole to see nobody out there. Come on, kid, you can save me. You know that, right? The invisible stranger asked. Certain that I'd eaten way too much candy or had just knocked myself senseless while sliding down the steps, I decided to turn off the TV and head to bed. Even after I turned on the box fan I used to provide ambient sound to help me sleep, I still heard the voice, which now sounded like it was coming from directly behind my second floor window. I sandwiched my head between two pillows, but it made little difference in the volume of the cries for help. Don't go to sleep and leave me out here, kid. All you have to do is just let me in, it begged. It wasn't until I saw the light trace across the far wall of my bedroom that signified my parents' arrival that the voice fell silent. For years, it carried on like that, always around midnight and only when I was alone. I got to the point of practically begging my folks not to leave me when they would inevitably head out for the night, even requested a babysitter when they would. They agreed to my request for someone to watch over me while they were gone, but that ended after I turned 12. Sometimes I was able to arrange a sleepover with a friend, but there would be times I would not weasel my way out of being alone as the hour approached. Regardless of how often the voice would return, I was never able to just ignore it or push it to the recesses of my mind while I focused on other things. When my folks would be gone all night, the voice wouldn't stop until I finally drifted to sleep, which always required quite the struggle to achieve. As the years progressed and my school days ended, I went off to college where I would have a roommate for a time. Though I would involve myself in any activity that would keep me from being alone in my dorm room after hours, there were still those times I would once again be at the mercy of the voice behind my door. No matter where I went in life, the stranger would follow, though there would never be evidence of his presence aside from the begging plea and knocks on the door. After college, I still maintained a roommate to avoid as many late-night visits as I could, though it would not keep them away entirely. I couldn't exactly forbid my housemates from having a life, after all. For some years, I would only have to worry about the cries for help around the weekends. Unfortunately, when my roommate decided to move in with his girlfriend, I was shit out of luck. Sure, I attempted to get another roommate, but my erratic and desperate behavior freaked out most interested parties. So, every single night after my housemate moved out, the knocking and the screaming came. No matter how hard I tried to ignore it, the volume would crank up higher and higher. I even tried checking into a busy hotel for the night, hoping that the crowded hallways would keep it away, but nope. As long as I was alone in my room, the pounding would begin again around midnight, without fail. For months, I fought against my slipping sanity, but I never could block it out. Earplugs? No. Earphones with blaring music? No. Nothing would keep the man's begs for help from reaching my ears. Finally, after way too many sleepless nights to count, I couldn't tolerate it anymore. As many times before, I gazed through the peephole to reveal nobody there, though the calls and knocks still bellowed through. 
with a heavy sigh and a racing heart that felt as though it would crack through my sternum, I wrapped trembling fingers around the doorknob and pulled it open. My jaw practically fell onto my chest when my eyes met the shredded figure in front of me. Half of his face had been torn away, leaving a reddened skull with strips of meaty tissue where skin once lay. His left arm had been ripped from his shoulder, and it was hard to differentiate the bloodied muscle and bone from the clumped threads of the shirt and hoodie that remained. His gut was splayed open, leaving oozing intestines hanging to the floor in a scarlet pool, and both his legs were a gruesome combination of moist ground beef and bone, with little holding them in one piece. Somehow, his right arm was the only part of him free of any manner of injury, which he still held out in front of him with his bald fist in preparation to knock once more. Thanks, man, he said, trying to smile with one side of his face that still had the ability to do so. You're a lifesaver, he continued before he collapsed to the ground. In a series of snapping and squishing sounds, his body twisted and contorted as it smoked, bubbled, and popped, shrinking down and dissolving into the fuzzy welcome mat and concrete pavement. Within seconds, all that remained of the stranger, who was only visible through the open door, was no more than a charred, crimson stain on the ground. I kicked at the damp mat that still wore the marks of many dirty feet, combined with the new red and burnt black to find nothing hidden underneath. Though my mind was reeling and my mouth still hung agape, I strolled across the pathway that led away from my house, nudging the mat toward the garbage can that stood at the end of my driveway. I picked up the carpeted sheet that now read, We, Me, on either side of the grisly stains by one of the untouched corners and dropped it in my trash bucket. I stood outside, staring back at my house with my head in a daze. Could that really be all I had to do to put an end to this madness? Would my nightly visits finally be over? I began to cackle like a crazy person while I paced back to my open door, feeling like my remaining marbles may indeed be rolling out of the confines of my noggin for good. Before I could reach the entry to my home, I heard what sounded like a pack of wild animals thundering their feet across the ground behind me. I whipped around to see three hideous and deformed dog-like creatures scampering across the road toward me. Thick, phlegmy slobber dripped from their gaping maws as they sprinted at me on muscular legs covered in matted, dreadlocked fur. I screamed at the top of my lungs and hauled ass back through my doorway and slammed it shut behind me. I quickly flipped the deadbolt latch and pressed my back to the door while the beast rammed into it from the other side. Wailing barks and growls blended with something that resembled the sound of a wood chipper might make if you threw 50 pounds of frozen food into it, squalled from outside. They did not attack the actual door again after the initial slam from the quickly ceased high-speed pursuit. I had no doubts were they to attempt to force their way in. My simple locks would not keep them at bay for long. I glanced through the peephole again to see the trio just pacing back and forth, still dripping that noxious drool with every whimper of their awful sounds. Each of them were quite large, easily twice the size of the largest dog I'd ever seen. Their bodies and limbs bulged with rippling muscles, and their mouths were filled with jagged and misshapen yellow teeth. Every one of the six enlarged eyes glowed a vibrant orange beneath their furrowed brow. Accepting that another sleepless night was ahead of me, I drew my largest kitchen knife from the rack beside my stove and sat on my couch trembling from head to toe. Of course, I had no doubt that a paltry blade used for preparing a meal would provide little defense against the horrendous beast. I just gripped onto the hilt like a safety blanket and prayed that they would try to force their way inside. At some point I must have fallen asleep, and by the time the sun rose, the beasts had moved on. As far as I could tell, anyway. 
I slowly pulled my door open to reveal nothing but the stained concrete behind it. I felt on edge for the rest of the day, but nothing else appeared out of place while I went about my daily grind. It wasn't until I was on my way home, after dining with some friends after work, that I understood the new trumbling situation I'd be forced to endure. The sun began to set on my drive back to my house, something that had never made me nervous before, not until midnight anyway. By the time I arrived on my street, the world was now lit by the subtle glow of the moon. It was then that I heard the barking and growling again. I darted my eyes to my rearview mirror to see those matted creatures speeding at me from behind. I slammed my foot to the floor, causing my Nissan to speed faster across the road to my house than I would have ever dared before. I was terrified at the idea of kids playing on the street or absent-minded drivers drifting into my lane, but I had to outrun these things and reach the safety of my home. I skidded into my driveway and felt my right tires lift from the ground as the left one spun to a halt, tearing into the grass and dirt of my front lawn. My heart was hammering against my chest while I sprinted to my front door. I could practically feel the foul breath of the demonic hellhounds on the back of my neck as I fumbled my key against the knob in an attempt to gain entry. I dared not look behind me until I finally achieved success and tripped onto the floor, kicking the door shut with my heel. I rolled over and reached out to latch my lock when I heard and felt the slam of the monstrous creature beginning another night of their atrocious wails calling from outside. This is how I live now. I never stay out after dark, no matter what. I feel a panic attack building up whenever I see the sun begin to recede for the night, whether I'm safely behind my walls or not. I don't date, I don't socialize. Those things only lead to the inability to put a door between me and my stalkers when night falls. I can't say mine is a happy existence, but I'm alive. I wonder sometimes if I'd allow the stranger entry the first time he begged for it. Would I be where I am now? Or would he have transferred this curse to me sooner? Somehow I doubt I'll ever have answers, but there has to be a way out of this, right? If you take nothing else from this tale, just remember this. Should I ever come knocking on your door after dark, no matter how hard I beg, no matter how much I cry, do not even acknowledge me. And for God's sake, don't let me in.